Hello, everybody. This is Brian Finkelmeyer with the V Auto Podcast, and I'm excited to talk about the car business, everything that's transpired with COVID, and everything that's happening in today's extremely interesting new car business with my good friend, Michael Brown. He's the owner and operator at Empire Auto Group in Huntington, New York on Long Island. Empire Auto Group operates 16 brands at 10 locations and in 2020 sold over 10,000 new and used vehicles. Let's now turn to my recorded podcast with Michael Brown. Michael, welcome to our podcast. Thanks, buddy. Great to see you. Great to talk to you. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about the Empire Auto Group and how you got started in the car business. Yeah, I mean, uh, Empire was uh, originated in 2019. It was kind of a coming back home for me. I, I cut my teeth in the Huntington area as a kid uh, working in a dealership. And uh, beyond that, worked for some, some larger companies, worked for Penske Automotive for quite a few years was lucky enough to um, work for John Stalupi and Atlantic Automotive Group for, for many years and actually became a partner with them. And then two years ago, I was able to break off on my own and form Empire. So, Michael, I have to say, I did not realize that you have an MBA from Boston University. So what was it about Auto Row that was more appealing to you than a new job on Wall Street? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, that, that that's really a funny story. So, uh, even growing up in the car business and working in all the different departments, when I did go to school uh, and got my master's, I decided I did want to work on Wall Street. And when I got back home, I talked it over with my parents and said, listen, I'm, I'm, my, my plan is to work in New York City and one day, you know, be a high-powered uh, Wall Street guy. And they said, well, that's all great, but you need to pay rent now. <laughs> so you need a job, and you need a job right now because rents will be coming due. So uh, I immediately went back to what I knew and got on the sales floor and was selling cars. And something changed for me when it became, uh, you know, permanent and more real that I actually was going to have to pay all my bills on my own, live on my own. And I looked around real quick, and I said, wait, if I could be pretty good at this, I could make a lot of money and do very well and uh, support a family. And so I, I dug my teeth in and said, let me, let me give it a shot before I actually jump out to Wall Street. And, you know, the rest really is history. Michael, that's really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, successful guys like you obviously are, are passionate about their business. And I'm wondering, has this passion of yours been something that's always been there? Or is this something that still continues to grow today? You know, it's funny. It, it has morphed. I would say it's greater, and I'll tell you why. It's so funny that it, it, today is a great example. Look at what we're going through. We went through COVID. We're going through a microchip uh, shortage, which is causing a huge crisis in our industry. But yet dealers find ways to evolve. Yeah. And we, we've done it so many times under so many circumstances. You could use 2008 so when the bottom fell out of the economy. You could use Hurricane Sandy uh, when it hit, hit, hit us so, so hard. You could use uh, the tsunami we had years ago uh, in, 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 in Asia and what happened there with supply. There's sure. so many times that we've been hit with a curveball that we have found a way to, to, to really evolve as a dealer body and come up with a way for us to be uh, extremely successful. So that's really, I think, what drives the passion. And, and I got to tell you, what it does for me is it lights the fire to want to grow. Totally. No, it's a, it's a, it is just impressive to watch, Michael. And, you know, one thing before you and I got on this morning, I was just kind of re thinking back upon a phone call that you made to me March of 2020, you know, maybe around the second or third week of March as the world was cratering and the stock market was losing two to three points a day. And um, I, I just remember the, the tone in your voice of concern of having to lay off an employees. And um, you were very, very concerned as, as dealers across the country. And clearly you being there in New York, really the epicenter of the COVID uh, problem, uh, it was really challenging moment for you. So can you talk a little bit about kind of how you work through that, uh, that, that tsunami of, of headwinds that you faced back in March and then how you guys have kind of persevered to come out through the other side. Yeah. You know, that was a scary time. I mean, uh, I will reflect back on that time 
so much now because, you know, things like that give you perspective, right? Sure. And it really sets you straight. Number one, health, right? Just look at health. And you don't have to look further than that to gain perspective to how many families were struck by such tragedy. And, 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 you, and you need to really understand that you need to live every day and protect your family and move forward. And really, when we were in that crisis, there was no business to be done. We were closed. Yeah. So we really said, okay, if we're going to be closed and we're seeing people in so much trouble, how can we help? Because we might as well do something. We're sitting here. We can't sell cars. We can't service cars. We literally were the epicenter in Huntington. And um, it, COVID had ripped through my stores. So we we developed a hotline. And the hotline really was for people to call us if they needed something. And what I mean by something, it could have been anything. Some people called that they needed to get uh, stuff from their pharmacy. Some people needed groceries. Some people needed a right to the doctor. Uh, the funniest one was some people, it was spring, and it was an elderly couple, and they wanted to do their spring gardening, but they really didn't have the the wherewithal to go get the mulch and spread it out. So we went and did it for them, and it was awesome. So it was just a, a really feel-good moment for a lot of people in my group. Uh, they wanted to do something, so we came together and uh, and got a lot done for the community. Yeah, you know, Michael, it's, it's interesting how now that we have this hindsight perspective on all that's transpired over the past, you know, uh, 18 months or so, but there have definitely been some silver lines of COVID. And I think many of us have felt a deeper sense of community. And I think your story really touches on that. You know, I, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned earlier, just this current headwind that we're faced with this microchip shortage, which seemed like it came out of nowhere. It's like we had enough challenges with everything else. And now this microchip shortage, and I was just looking this morning, day supply and new cars is down uh, about 40 days across the industry. I don't think I ever saw a 40-day supply across the industry in my career. Used cars is in the mid-30s. How, how are you managing through this uh, challenge of being able to acquire inventory, both on the new and used side of your business? Yeah, it's, it's really a challenge, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but uh, I'll tell you that the, the, it, it really comes down to uh, your salespeople and your team really, really doing a great job selling at this point. It's it's no more, you know, the customer comes in, they choose from, you know, so many different makes and models. We actually got to sell value in what we have. Yeah. And that's, that's a technique that we would say, well, that's always been the case. Not really. Remember, you, you said it. When have we seen a 40-day supply on new cars? You know, there's been many brands that I've been involved with with their, you know, you, you've seen a much, 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 thicker day supply where your inventory allows so many different color combinations, so many different equipment packages, and the, the customer really has this choice. And we've always lived by the motto of, hey, we're, we have a huge inventory, so pick whatever you'd like out right. of customer convenience. And that's just not the case today. So what you really need to do is you really need to do a great job selling the value and what inventory you do have. So that's really on the new side is where the focus is, is sure. sell what you have and be and, and, and be prepared to sell what you have. Um, you know, and on the pre-owned side, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's a simple one. When it comes to your off-lease cars, all my guys are instructed to just hit the button. <laughs> Every single car you can get, I'm not concerned with how many miles it has. I'm not concerned with – I just want to – acquire inventory and we could de we decide after the fact on how we're going to dispose of it some of them are going to be retailed some of them are going to go to the auctions but listen it is a competitive environment as we've ever seen the rental car companies are big in the marketplace right, right now because right. they can't get new cars so the bottom line is guys you buy every off-lease car you can and you start there that's just the foundation building block then Really what you want to do is you want to get in your service drive and how we, you know, we always love to look to sell cars in our drive. Right sure. now, i got to be honest with you, Brian, I'm looking for that customer that might be a two, three, four car family and you got one of them working from home so they really don't need that other car and if you can yeah. impress them with some good equity in their vehicle, we're going to give them a ride home <laughs> and keep that car. 
and we are finding some success there. We definitely are finding some success where customers really could use some extra money right now, and they're shocked because they may be in a lease, and they've always been educated that, oh, I'm in a lease, I'm upside down, and I got negative equity. Well, that's just not the case today. So yeah. we have an opportunity to buy some of those cars. Yeah, it is crazy. I uh, was talking to one of our performance managers recently who said that uh, one of his stores had looked at a 2018 Toyota Tundra that had been retailed for 32000 a year ago, and they booked it out at forty grand today with retail on the car. So, I mean, this is like unprecedented seeing used cars actually appreciate in value. Hey, I wanted to ask you, Michael, um, one of the big – you know, buzzwords throughout COVID within the retail space has been all about this digital retailing. And that's, you know, probably one of the big themes that's picked up so much energy. And and I recognize, I think many dealerships have made uh, big investments in their digital retailing platforms and making adjustments to their websites and probably their BDC departments and all that goes along with it. But in your mind, is that going to be one of the great sort of legacies from the pandemic on the retail car business, or is there something else that's happened uh, through COVID that maybe is even more transformational than digital retailing? Uh, so here's what I'll say. I, I think that the best thing to ever happen for digital retailing was COVID. Sure. It really gave them an opportunity now to have, have every reason for people to transform to digital retailing. And I got to be honest with you, the percentage stayed just about the same. You know, there's okay. a very small percentage of our customers, and there is a reason to have digital retailing. It's transparent, and it's efficient. Here's the problem, and here's why I'm a skeptic. As a consumer, I just got to believe it, this is not a shirt. This is a car. You want to touch it. You want to feel it. You want to yeah. drive it. And, and, and I'm going to tell you more than that. You do want a relationship with the people you're buying the car from. And yeah. all of those things can't happen if you're on one end of a computer. Right. It's just right. so difficult. Now, listen, with that said, Brian, I, I do think there's a place for digital retailing because if a consumer knows what they want, has already, you know, driven the car for three years and it's the same car again, absolutely. And and the, another thing digital retailing is good for after they've done their research. But it does. I just don't believe digital retailing allows the consumer just never to go in the go in the dealership because it's just going to be so difficult for them to understand what they're buying you can't right. drive a car on a computer you just can't do it at least not today <laughs> yeah no so i think it's interesting and i think that people as you're saying have always been a differentiator between the good dealers and the very best dealers the best dealers always have the best people and and it has been interesting to watch you know players like carvana and these different uh, players that are entering the market with the kind of, you know, removing people from the equation. But it sounds like listening to you that, that you still think that people is a real differentiator in helping drive your success. Right. Yeah. Listen, human capital is, you know, there, there, if there's a checklist of items that are important to our industry, human capital is number one. And anything we want to talk about is a far distant second. It's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so changing gears, I wanted to, to hear from you, Michael. I know that, um, you know, grosses in the new and used car business are just off the charts. And, you know, we've, I don't think we've ever seen a situation where demand is outpacing supply in the way it is. I think April, I read, was the third best SAR, 18.6 million units uh, in April of 2021. Typically, April is not a great month for the car business, but just uh, absolute blistering pace. I'm curious. Are you starting to see that your fixed operations business coming on stronger? Because obviously last year during the shutdown and whatnot, customers were driving less. People were less apt to bring their car in for service. Are you starting to see that that fixed ops piece of your business is rebounding? We are. We are. Uh, it depends on the brand, um, but we are seeing that. What I tell you, what's, what's more important to us is the focus. It gives us an opportunity to come up for air and really spend a lot of time and focus on the fixed operations side of the business. Because as we know in this business, just like everything else, it's a cycle, right? This yeah. isn't going to last forever. So if you have gotten a taste of the profitability and you say, hey, wow, I wonder how I can maintain this net to sale number, there is a way. And it's to get your absorption to a point where 
If business goes back to a street side on the sales side, if your fixed absorption gets to a number that's going to get you to that net to sale, you're home free. Right. So what we've done is said, hey, we want to invest right now. We're investing in some additional training. We're investing in some process where we are really taking an analytical look at every technician, every writer, every job, and figuring out how we could have done better. And it's teaching us a lot right now. So we're really in a in a learning phase on our fix ups. We're taking the opportunity to do this because usually we are so focused on today, 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 yeah. and we never we never take a step back and say, okay, do we have time to analyze this and spend some money, spend some time, so we could pay it forward for ourselves in the future? And it's rare people do that in the car business because it's a month to month business, right? Sure. Oh, I got to make them up this month. I'll worry about that next month. Well, we've taken a step back and fixed up and said, okay, we're, 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 we're not going to look at it month to month for this second. We're going to look at it from a standpoint of let's analyze each job and how we're doing this to figure out how we could have done better. And I think that that's what's going to pay dividends going forward. That's great. Great, uh, great advice, Michael. I think in many uh, phases of our lives, this COVID has given us that opportunity to take a step back and, some people have gotten healthier and improved their fitness or they improved their fixed ops department or whatever it might be. But I, I want to close with just one last quick question. And, and you talked earlier about curveballs. So this is a bit of a curveball. But I know, Michael, you're a longtime Jets fan, and I know <laughs> that it's never easy coming off the 2-14 and 14th season. Um, so I'm curious, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for uh, you and the rest of the Jets nation? Yeah, listen, I think there's a lot of reasons for Jeff Nation to be positive. You know, we we didn't get up every Sunday morning with any good feelings or any hope. The first the first thing I'll say about that, and I'll be very brief, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll be impactful. The first thing that we did was hired a head coach, and you know, we didn't have one unfortunately. And how that happened is still beyond me. Most Jets fans are still shaking their heads, but I got to say from the from the look of it, from 30,000 feet, it looks like we hit we hit our nail on the head on this one. And this guy is sophisticated, he's energetic, and he wants to win. And I think he's paired with a general manager who has the right idea. Now, this is not a short-term fix. I think we are a couple years away, but if you look – forget the season this year for a minute. Look at next year's draft. Look at all the picks. Look at all the free agent cap space we have. Take that and dump in what we did in the draft and free agency this year. I think a step forward this year, and I think contention in a couple of years. A lot of it rides on one guy, though, and that's Zach Wilson. All right. Well, well, that was the head coach, folks, of the Empire Auto Group, Michael Brown, <laughs> who's uh, one of the best coaches I've ever met in the car business. And I just want to say, Mike, thank you so much for uh, joining our V Auto podcast. I'm sure our listeners enjoyed listening to your uh, your insights on the car business, and we look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Brian, thanks so much for having me. All right, buddy. Take care. Take care.